Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming and welcome to the very first broadcasting session of machine learning meetups. My name is Daniel Kuchta, and now I would like to briefly introduce the project. Machine learning meetups started back in October 2014 in Prague as a local project. As the popularity of the meetups grew, so did the project itself. As of today, we already spent two countries and four cities with over two and a half thousand community members. Operating as a non-profit organization, we attract dozens of developers and machine learning enthusiasts to come and meet every month. Our mission is to build strong communities, encourage sharing of knowledge, and attract more talent to the one of the most attractive industries of today. You can find us on Facebook as Machine Learning Meetups, on Twitter at MLMUCZ, or you can visit our website mlmu.org where you can find out more. A big thanks goes to our stunning supporters, which are for Czech Republic, CAI, Konica Minolta, Seznam CZ, Rosum, and Innovatrix, and for Slovak Republic, CAI, Fotoneo, and Innovatrix again. Today, we are pleased to welcome Andrew Trask, who is a PhD student at the University of Oxford, currently studying deep learning. He's also the author of Grokking Deep Learning, an instructor in Udacity's Deep Learning Nano Degree, and the author of a popular machine learning blog, iamtrust.github.io. Andrew will talk about private deep learning and the impacts of this technology combined with blockchain and peer-to-peer -peer in a new open source platform called OpenMind. Should you have any questions, please go ahead and ask them on Slido under the event code MLMU. The Q&A session will be held right after the talk. Without further ado, over to you, Andrew. All right, very good. Yeah, so I'm very excited to um, present kind of the latest, uh, the latest update with OpenMind Project, and we'll be um, describing several different pieces of it. And we'll go ahead and um, uh, share my screen uh, so that you can see uh, a slide presentation I prepared. Um, see, can you see that? Okay. Is that uh, is that presenting for you there? Hopefully so. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah. So I'm um, today. We'll talk to you about OpenMind. So, um, so let's begin. OpenMind is an open source community focused on three different things researching and developing and elevating tools for sec secure, privacy-preserving, and value-aligned artificial intelligence. So um, if you've been around OpenMind for a little while, you might notice that this is slightly different than um, kind of a previous mission that we had, which was focusing mostly on the decentralization of data and models. And it's focusing more on, on kind of a specific subset of what we think it's going to take to construct safe artificial intelligence in the long run. Um, so I specifically want to address these three sections, so secure, privacy-preserving, and value-aligned. So secure AI is referring to methods, uh, and in our case, pieces of software um, and, and Python libraries that can protect models, right? So, so we're in, in secure AI, we're talking about protecting um, the actual weights, parameters, and architecture um, of, of a machine learning or AI model. Um, Privacy-preserving AI is all about protecting the data. Right, so we're going to be talking a little bit about that, but it's, it's it's a different but highly related category of protecting the models, and it uses a different set of techniques. And third, value-aligned artificial intelligence is talking about um, how we can we can set up ecosystems with with you know these these two tools, and then things communities like blockchain um, and peer-to-peer -peer protocols to create uh, ecosystems that promote the types of AI that we want to see and discourage the AI that we don't. Without further ado, let's keep going. So what does OpenMind do on, on a regular basis? So first and foremost, we raise awareness of secure, private, and value-aligned AI. So we, we participate in things, things like this. Uh, so OpenMind, uh, once again, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a company or a startup. It's really an, an open source community that's, that's designed for education and for, for uh, making tools as accessible as possible. And secondly, uh, we build those tools. So, so in our case, uh, we're, we're focusing on lowering the barrier to entry um, to to leveraging secure, private, and value-aligned AI um, by making open source tools readily available. 
So for example, many of you might have heard of techniques like federated learning or homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, or differential privacy. Um, however, you'll notice that these tools aren't necessarily readily available in your standard deep learning toolkits. So uh, a large part of what we do as a community is extend major deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow uh, and PyTorch with the, the components necessary uh, to, to make secure private and value-aligned AI as accessible as possible. And finally, of course, as a community, we get together and, and have uh, have a good time, uh, not just online, but also also in person at our hackathons uh, all around the world. The first thing I want to talk about um, is going to be the AI business model, because that's really where the conversation around um, kind of AI applied in the real world uh, takes place. Uh, and it's also where we can really understand the dynamics that are at play uh, that we would like for some of our open source tools to help help industry address. Then we're going to talk about um, the core technologies that we're, we're actually building and the core tools. Uh, we're going to educate you first about federated learning, secondly about homomorphic encryption, uh, third about multi-party computation, and finally we're going to talk a little bit about a gradient marketplace, um, which is where we interface with technologies like blockchain. And then we're going to finish with a high-level overview of OpenMind, uh, Open Minds Roadmap uh, and hopefully a demo or two of some, some relatively new code that was pushed here in the last couple of weeks. Um, so. Uh, this is general today. My business model really starts with what a company what we'll call it AI Incorporated, right? So AI Incorporated has some sort of of data feed that's able to acquire. So it acquires information, say, from, from a, a social application that it either has as a part of its business, or maybe maybe it acquires data through through another means. Um, and then the second thing that AI Incorporated will do once they have once they have access to a data set, is they will train a machine learning model that can transform one data set into another, right? So and it typically is transforming you know, a data set that's easy to acquire into a data set that's difficult to acquire. So in this case, we're taking, you know, we're saying it's, it's uh, some sort of company that's taking personal statistics about individuals, so like Joe, Jane, and Jack, and learning how to transform them into something that's difficult to know, which is you know, their credit worthiness. You know, where are they gonna be, uh, are they likely to default on a loan, for example? And then the third, and once this model is trained, the third thing that most AI business models do is then sell the use of that model uh, in the form of either an application or an API, or perhaps they they um, they actually you know maybe their their machine learning as a service, and they actually deliver just the model itself and allow someone else to package it. Um, but it's really these three steps that make up the the. Um, the, the standard AI business model, right? So, so if you look across Silicon Valley or or um, um, other major social ecosystems and kind of the main AI businesses out there, these are kind of the three main steps that almost all people in the business of AI um, participate in. And so, we as an open source community would like to build tools that that interface with this business model and and perhaps even help encourage it to go into into a, into a better direction um, if if we can identify some some things that we'd like to improve about it. So let's talk about things that we'd like to improve about this business model. Step one is acquiring data about individuals. Now, the first thing that is, I guess, been in the news a lot lately as well is that this data acquisition, acquisition step requires that people lose control of their data, right? So it's sort of, it's sort of, a, um, it's sort of a system that, that now, in, in order for you know, company A to be able to aggregate data from a lot of individuals to, to be able to train a machine learning model, um, they have to have a copy Andrew. of it. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? So, uh, yeah. So, could I uh, could you please try to uh, refresh your your uh, screen sharing because we we still see the first ah yeah okay how's that yeah, yeah okay. uh, you, still, you still see the first slide is that or um, should I go back uh well it's up to you okay, okay. do you want me to, do you want me to just stay here here I'll, I'll I'll flip to these real quick so here's the um, Open Minds Open Source Community. Our key activities are to raise awareness, to build tools, and to build community. Um, this is the general outline of what we're going to be talking about. So we're first going to talk about kind of the AI business model and things that we'd like to improve about it. Then we're going to talk about kind of a core tech section, uh, and then we're going to go into the actually Open Mind roadmap and demos. Um, these are the three steps of the AI business model, right? So we have uh, AI Incorporated. First thing they do is acquire data about people. Then they train a model that transforms one data set into another. And then they sell the use of that model, say, to, to a big bank, right? Um, so we have these three steps, the AI business model. Um, and, and so what we'd like to do is identify certain problems with this business model that we'd like to improve, right? Um, and so the first, the first things that we want to uh, improve are um, 
uh, privacy and set in this this kind of sensitive product property. So this is really where we where we where we just dropped off a second ago. Um, so step one is in the typical AI business model is acquire a data set, right? You can't really um, be in the business of doing doing machine learning out in the real world unless you have access to data in one way or another. However, right now, the way that tools are set up um, is that in, in order for companies to do this, they pretty much have to acquire a copy. Um, if they're going to acquire a copy, that means that the people who create the data set no longer are the only individuals uh, who own a copy of that data set, right? People are, are relinquishing control when you relinquish a copy of of a piece of data to another person. And obviously, there's some regulatory constraints about it, and then that that environment. Um, but uh, as far as the way that our tools are designed, right? Our tools are designed with the assumption that all of the data from many different potential sources is going to be in one place when the model is being trained. Um, and so that leads this first step to kind of uh, have this sort of undesirable privacy side effect. <clears throat> and the second one, which is a little bit of a derivative um, of, of the first, is that um, products that require a, that would require a significant amount of sensitivity to the data simply don't get made. So if you think about um, <clears throat> if you think about if you wanted to train a classifier that was going to um, help predict um, when an individual was going to cause self harm or or have some sort of mental mental disorder or mental breakdown, um, it, machine learning should be able to detect these kinds of problems. But the 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 thing that really I think prevents a lot of this, that particular application from maturing is that uh, in or, the kind of data set that you would need to train a machine learning model to make that kind of prediction is so sensitive that that it's 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 cumbersome to even come across the data. Um, and, and, and so unfortunately, because we haven't solved the privacy problem, those types of really sensitive applications and really sensitive machine learning models, um, I argue, uh, don't, don't get made. And that's a nasty side effect. Now, step two, um, let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you, um, since the full screen was having some troubles. Um, I, can see. I don't know. Oh, there we go. Um, so step two was to train a model that predicts unknown facts about a person using known facts. And this has some side effects that, that are perhaps a little bit less desirable as well. So um, first and foremost, we have this contagious privacy loss. So if one person reveals private information, then machine learning can be used to reveal private information of others through prediction. So if you think about, for example, um, Twitter, right? Some, some percentage of individuals include uh, the city they live in um, and their age. Um, as a part of their public Twitter profile. Maybe we'll say it's 10% of people, right? But that's still millions and millions of individuals. Um, and so the, the interesting thing here is that, that since, um, since uh, uh, that information has been made public alongside their tweets, uh, people who are in machine learning can, take a, can train a machine learning model to predict um, people's age or, or their kind of city or country they live in based on their tweets, right? So if you have this classifier that can that can take someone's tweets and predict their age or their their um, general location, like their country, um, then you can also apply this model to people who maybe didn't reveal that information, right? And so that's that's one of these these side effects. So even if even if I Andrew Andrew Trask have some sort of Twitter profile and I don't put my location on it and I don't put my age on it, because other people have revealed that information about them, machine learning can divulge that information about me. Right, and that's just something we don't like as much. Um, secondly, uh, is lack of competition. So, um, since data gets aggregated into these sort of centralized sources, um, data ownership then becomes a competitive advantage. Right. So, so there's very little market competition because most data sets are proprietary. Right. This there's there's a strong incentive for data sets to stay locked up in kind of an ivory tower, um, and it this becomes a very defensible position. Right. Um, and then finally. Um, uh, I also make the argument that there's a little bit of hidden bias in in that uh, data sets that are, are aggregated using a specific app or say uh, for a specific purpose. Um, let's say it's located inside of one particular hospital in the southern United States, right? Um, those data sets are going to be a little bit skewed just to the, the subsets of the population that they were collected from, right? So you can imagine if we had sort of of an open marketplace for data where you could actually trade across data from lots of different locations, it's more likely 
you will have higher quality and a less biased model than you would if you only train it in, in say, you know, one data silo collected from one company in one part of one country, right? Um, uh, yeah. And the third step um, in kind of the AI business model was to sell the use of an application. Right, and there are, there are various properties of this that are that are undesirable. So so first and foremost, it's very rare that individuals who supply data um, actually get a kind of royalty as a result of models that are trained on their data. Um, secondly, we have we have sort of headwinds um, for this building process because we don't really know how valuable any given data point is to the intelligence of a consuming machine learning model. Um, third, um, it's difficult to actually understand model. Um, when a machine learning model is out in the wild, right? Um, whether that model is of high quality, right? So imagine if I train a machine learning model on a company's, um, uh, you know, I, I'm a company operating a healthcare business in in southern United States, and I train a machine learning model, um, and then I come up here to the UK, um, uh, and I I use that model on locals here at the, at the UK. So I'm, I'm providing some sort of health service, right? It's very difficult for me to know the accuracy of my model if I don't have some sort of sort of uh, ability to collect um, that accuracy from my my deployment uh, uh, test group, and this is this is a relatively frequent issue um, in kind of the deployment of uh, in the AI industry. Uh, and then finally, digital assets are hard to protect. So um, when when a model gets sold uh, in pa or packaged in the form of an app. Um, this actually becomes really, really difficult to, to, to protect if the model is really valuable. And this is a centralizing, uh, centralizing force. Uh, so if you think about how, um, um, let's say I'm a healthcare company and I, I build that can help predict um, when you, know, you should go to bed at night. Um, in order to have uh, in order to have the best night's sleep, right? And I think that this model is worth ten million dollars. I can either build an iPhone app and send that model down to a bunch of people's phones, um, and it can predict locally and protect their privacy, um, or I can aggregate everyone's data up to the cloud service and make the prediction there, and then just send the prediction back down to a phone. Right. So there's two different scenarios here. One requires me to to um, put my $10 million sleep model at risk by sending it down to an iPhone, right? And the other one requires me to aggregate inputs to that model up to a cloud service so that I can protect uh, my machine learning model. So once again, we have this, this issue of even when we create really valuable models and then we want to use them for prediction, um, we tend to start aggregating uh, data even on the application side just because we, we don't actually want to send our model down from the cloud. So. How do we solve these problems? Well, the first potential solution uh, is focusing on training, right? So if we could train AI on data that we can't see, well, this would be a really great privacy win because individuals would not need to reveal their data, right? So if, if we could figure out a way to be able to use TensorFlow or use PyTorch or use one of these major deep learning frameworks on top of data sets, on top of tensors, like on top of, of, of CSV files, right? That we as the machine learning practitioners did not have access to. Um, then we could we could potentially solve part of this privacy problem. So, with that in mind, let's continue into kind of the core technologies of Open Mind, um, and, and we're really going to focus on being able to train model uh, train models on data that we can't see that we don't have access to. Um, so the first stop on this this journey is through federated learning. So um, if uh, if if we were here in person, I would ask you know how many people have heard of federated learning uh, in, in the past. Um, these days, I, I suppose it's around 10 to 20 percent of people that I run into have heard about this really awesome technology. So this was invented, um, or I guess the term was coined at Google uh, a couple of years ago by uh, by a great team up in in uh, Seattle. And uh, what federated learning is about, um, it's about uh, really changing a, a pretty simple paradigm um, in standard machine learning. And let me show you what I mean. So here we have non-federated learning. Right, so this is sort of your normal environment. We have AI incorporated. Uh, they aggregate a bunch of data and, a, and an, a, an untrained model into one location, and they perform training. Right, so this all this happens sort of in in the cloud of AI incorporated. All the data and all the models are sitting in the same place. Federated learning is about flipping the script, and instead of bringing all the data to a location, um, the during training, the model is actually brought down to uh, 
individual data owners. So we have Jane right here, right? So the model goes down to Jane, then the model learns a little bit, then the model goes back up and is updated in the cloud. Then the model goes down to Jack, right? And it's getting a little smarter, it goes back up to the cloud. And then the model goes down to Joe, trains a little bit more on Joe's data, uh, and then goes back up to the cloud. So as you can see here, um, instead of ag instead of bringing all the data to the model, right, bringing all the data to AI Incorporated, um, we're bringing the model out to the data. And this allows us to be able to, in theory, train machine learning models on data that we don't have access to, that AI Incorporated, you know, a big team of data scientists, right, does not have access to. And that's really the idea behind federated learning. Now, um, there's really only a couple places that you can you can um, start to do federated learning at this point. So TensorFlow has some tech, some uh, infrastructure for this, but it's it's not really designed to do federated learning, say across the Atlantic, right? It's really only designed to do um, do training across machines that are all inside the same sort of cloud warehouse, right? So so if you have ten machines and you want to train a model. Uh, you know, times fast, you can train a model that uses 10 different machines in a, in a cluster. Um, but it's not really built to, to help you find and train on machine learning models that are, are very, on data sets that are very disparate, that might be spread around, you know, around the world, right? Um, so one of the projects, and the, one of the first projects we're working on in OpenMind um, is extending TensorFlow and PyTorch with the tools necessary to do federated learning over peer-to-peer um, um, and also blockchain attached compute grid, right? So the idea, and I'll show you a little bit more what that means uh, here in a little while, but the idea is that we're building infrastructure into PyTorch and TensorFlow that allows you to, to discover and train machine learning models on top of data sets that are spread over a large number of locations and machines all through peer-to-peer -peer, uh, connections. So one of our potential our first potential solution was to train AI on data we couldn't see, right, using this tool called federated learning. Um, the pro is that the data is kept private, right? We really like this. So, so the data never leaves the original data owner. Um, and um, yeah, so their privacy is protected. However, we have these sort of secondary issues. First and foremost, the AI is put at risk, right? The, if we have a $10 million sleep model, right, a, a machine learning model that helps predict when people uh, should go to bed to have a really good good night's sleep. Um, in order to to actually train it, like we're sending it all the way down to to Joe, right? So Joe actually has a full copy of the model, which means that Joe could steal it, and that's totally unacceptable, right? So that's that's a really big risk. There's a huge risk of theft. So if we, I mean, you could think about it. If we use say ten thousand people to help train this model, which is a, a even a pretty small data set in the grand scheme of things, um, that you know, it only takes one of the 10,000 people to go ahead and, 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 and steal this model or a partially trained version of this model and try to sell it on a secondary market. Um, secondly, um, we haven't exactly fully solved the privacy concern. Think about having a sentiment model, right? Let's say we're going to train a machine learning model that can take tweets and predict their sentiment. Um, so any of you who are familiar with training sentiment models will, will remember that that you you have typically a, a, a word embedding uh, layer as the first layer. So let's say that I um, perform one update. Uh, you know, I, I I have a machine learning model and I send it down to to Joe, right? And Joe has a tweet that says Aardvarks like cranberries, right? So Joe does one training. Um, and he says, aardvarts like cranberries is a positive tweet, right? Because it's something someone likes, right? So it's, it's generally positive. And then he, so he does one training step, taking the, the tweet, aardvarks like am, cranberries, and predicting um, that it should predict po positive, and he updates all of his weights, and then he gives the model back to AI Incorporated. The thing is, is that AI Incorporated could actually look inside of the word embeddings and compare the word embeddings that he sent to Joe with the word embeddings that he got back. And he would notice that the only weights that changed were for the words aardvarks, the word likes, and the word cranberries, right? So, so even though we're using this federated learning technique, we could still look at the weights and look at the diff between, between what AI Incorporated sent to Joe and what AI Incorporated got back from Joe and be able to, to tweak out and pull out um, um, interesting information that actually reveals what Joe trained on. Um, 
So we haven't totally solved this, this privacy, privacy constraint yet. We'll look at more technologies in a second. And of course, because we haven't solved privacy, we still have the sensitive product problem that we talked about before. So let's update our potential solution. Now we want to train an AI on data we cannot see without revealing the model itself, right? Or it's to anyone, right? So we want to hide both the gradients and the weights during the process of federated learning, right? We have two tools that we're going to look at for doing this. Uh, and they're both very, very interesting tools. So right now we're in the realm of secure AI, right? So federated learning is in the realm of private AI because it's about protecting the model. Now we're gonna focus on secure AI, which is all about protecting the weights. So first stop, let's talk about homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic encryption is really quite an extraordinary uh, class of algorithms. So there's, there's more than one type of homomorphic encryption out there, um, but they all have, have some similar properties. So let's just say, um, if you're familiar with encryption, um, then I guess this API will sort of make, make sense to you, right? So in this case, we're gonna take the number three, um, and let's say we have this homomorphic encryptor and it generates a piece of gibberish called cipher A, right? It's a series of, of ones and zeros. Cool. And then we're going to do this for the number five, right? So we have the number five encrypted with a homomorphic encryptor, and we have cipher B. It's another series of ones and zeros. So this is just total gibberish. Like, if you just saw this, saw these ones and zeros spray painted on the street, you'd have no idea what it was encoding. Homomorphic encryption does something very special. For example, what it does is it allows you to do mathematical operations on the encrypted values such that when you decrypt the result, it will decrypt to whatever mathematical operation you performed on the encrypted result. So in this particular case, if I take ciphertext A, this series of ones and zeros, right? And I multiply that ciphertext by two, by the regular scalar number two, and then decrypt the result, it will decrypt to a six. That's, that's one of the core ideas behind homomorphic encryption. The, the, the general purpose idea, computation on encrypted information, between the computation doesn't know the values of the thing that he's computing, he or she is computing, right? So in this particular case, we're looking at you know, two times ciphertext A um, would decrypt to a six, and ciphertext A plus ciphertext B would decrypt to an eight. Pretty, pretty cool stuff, huh? Now, there is various kinds of homomorphic encryption. So first we have partially homomorphic encryption. This means you can do some arithmetic operations such as addition and multiplication, but you can't do all, right? Um, somewhat homomorphic encryption means that you can do any operation, but only a few times before you have to decrypt and then re-encrypt. Um, uh, so this has to do with each time you, you perform. So encryption is all about hiding uh, real information inside of a certain amount of noise, right? Um, so unfortunately, when you when you actually perform these arithmetic op operations, when you you know you multiply the ciphertext, the noise grows. And so there's this thing called um, uh, basically it can it can it limits the number of, of operations you can do for for techniques that are some only somewhat homomorphic. And finally we have fully homomorphic encryption, which means that you can take two encrypted values or in any number of encrypted values and do as many operations as you want um, uh, without without you know losing without accidentally corrupting the the values that are being stored. Um, generally speaking, so these partially homomorphic encryption algorithms are going to be much faster than the fully homomorphic encryption. So there's sort of a increasing degree of complexity of computational overhead as you get more features, right? So this one has all the features, but it tends to be very slow. This one only has some of the features, but it tends to be quite a bit faster. Um, and this one, of course, is somewhere, somewhere in between. So now the next thing I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of an intuition for the types of mechanisms that are underneath homomorphic encryption. So we're gonna be looking at um, a part of the first fully encryption scheme. Um, I'll, I'll show you what I mean by a part here in a second, but I just want to give you a little intuition for how you can you can hide numbers in a way that that um, the ciphertext, the encrypted versions, allow you to do these kinds of mathematical operations. So let's say we have a, a numbers a numbers between zero and ten, right? So we're going to hide um, we're going to hide a number that's on this number line. So let's you know we might want to hide the number three or the number seven, but like this is the plain text value. This is the, this is the raw uh, secret 
that we're going to try to try to try to hide. And we're going to, to try to hide this number in what's called our ciphertext space, right? So this is our plain text space, and this is our ciphertext space. So we're going to try to hide a number between 0 and 10 inside of the number line between 0 or 100. And our, we have a few conditions, right? So we're going to hide it somewhere between 0 and 100. We, only we should know what it is. And we want to have this homomorphic property where we can add two encrypted numbers together. Um, and then when we decrypt it, it will, it will decrypt to the addition of the two encrypted numbers that we, we summed. Cool? So let's, uh, let's check out how we can do this. So let's, let's say um, the plain text is the number two, right? So we're going to try to hide the number two. Um, if we said that our ciphertext was just equal to our plain text, well, it's not hidden at all, but it is technically stored uh, between 0 and 100. That's not good enough, right? What if we instead created this secret? So we have a secret value. In this case, it's the value 10. OK? And if we calculate our ciphertext, our encrypted value, as um, um, secret times a random int, I shouldn't say radius, I should say random int, um, plus um, the encrypted value itself, right? That means that we could technically store the number 2 at any of these locations, right? What we're basically saying is that um, we're going to store it um, in the way that you measure uh, what the actual value is, its distance from um, this kind of mod 10 interval, right? So, so in this case, this is 2, 12, 22, 32, 42, 52, 62, 72, and so on, right? Um, and as long as people don't know this, this secret key, um, you know, it becomes difficult to interpret one of these values. And perhaps the most extraordinary thing is that in, you know, hiding the number, encrypting the number in this way gives us a really interesting property. So let's say we encrypted the number 2 to the number 22. So this is our, our, our ciphertext. And 3 to the number 53. Uh, if we add 22 and 53 together, we get 75, which decrypts to the number 5. Cool? So this is one example of a, a form of encryption. Now, this was not perfectly robust, but the, the intuition still holds. Um, one way to, to hide the numbers, 2 and 3, so that we can actually perform arithmetic on the hidden values, on the ciphertext, on the encrypted values, so that when we decrypt it, it decrypts to the correct number. And this, this interval, the frequency at which this sort of folds over, or this repeats, is our secret key. So if you do have a secret key, it becomes very easy to decrypt, because all I have to do is just see what's the distance between it and the next earliest partition. And without the secret key, you have no idea what the number 53 or 37 or 72 is actually encoding. So what does this have to do with secure AI? Well, as it turns out, this can be used in tandem with federated learning. The idea here being that um, in this particular example, we encrypted individual numbers, right, two and three. So what we want to do is instead in think about, you know, it's all these little weights, right, all these little numbers. What we do is we can homomorphically encrypt all of these numbers, right? And then when we send this model down to Jane, so it's encrypted now, it's this little, little box. So you see right here, that's a little encrypted box. So we encrypt it in the cloud. Then we send it down to Jane, and Jane performs training on this model while it's in an encrypted state, and then sends an update back up to AI Incorporated, right? So the idea here is that we're still doing federated learning, however, um, the model is protected because all of its weights are encrypted. Cool. And then we can do the same thing we did before by going to Jack. Um, and, then down, and then, of course, at the end, we have an optimized model. So back to our potential solution. Train AI on data we cannot see without revealing the AI or its training updates to anyone. Homomorphic encryption. Home now, the problem with homomorphic encryption um, is, is a couple fold. So first and foremost, homomorphic encryption requires that you have um, a public and, and a private key. So um, this uh, in our open marketplace design became a little bit of an issue um, because it was unclear where we should actually put the public and private keys. Um, secondly, 
um, homomorphic encryption is actually still really slow. Remember I talked about these different varieties up here? So we talked about, um, let's see here, partially homomorphic, somewhat homomorphic, and fully homomorphic. Well, in order to do machine learning for arbitrary neural networks, we actually need fully homomorphic encryption. But the problem is fully homomorphic encryption um, is very, very, very slow. Um, it's much too slow for most machine, most of the big deep learning models that we would like to be able to do. However, there is a different kind of algorithm that is very similar um, called multi-party computation. Uh, and the real difference in homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, homomorphic encryption is as, as public key and for text and you, you encrypt it and then it, you can send that encrypted value and do whatever like it's, it's a form of encryption it's a class of encryption multi-party computation however uh, instead of hiding a value it's about sharing a value right so what multi-party computation lets lets people do is is um you know five people can can share the number six right or the number ten um it, and they can share it in such a way that no single person actually knows what the plain text value of that number is. It's pretty cool. Let's check it out. So multi-party computation starts off with this function. So let's say we have a equals five. We run it through our NPC share splitter, and it splits it into five shares. Now, in this particular case, um, if you'll, you'll notice, that if you sum all these shares together, um, it will sum up to five. Right, so the way that we restore all these shares is through a simple sum, and there are actually several multi-party computation algorithms that leverage um, leverage something very much like this. Right, so we have shares A, we split it into five shares, uh, and we can give those shares to five people. Right, now let's say we did this to another number, B equals three, so we split that into another five shares, and then we give each of those shares to individual people. Right, so so we have. Uh, uh, one and two, right, going to person one, negative three and negative five, going to person two, five and eight, going to person three, zero and negative three, going to person four, and so on, right? So we have these five different people that are both have shared ownership of A and B. And the cool thing is that, oh, here we go. If each of them, let's say we want to do addition, we want to, we want to sum these two numbers together. So it should return the number eight, right? If person one sums their shares together, so one plus two is three, negative three plus negative five is negative eight, five plus eight is 13, zero plus negative three is one, and so forth. This, this new arithmetic, so it's, it's when we, the, the two really comes from this step. It's, it's five different people in this case, um, all doing computation together on a secret value that no single person actually necessarily knows the value of, right? Unless someone told them ahead of time, right? But their share does not give away any information about the value. And as it turns out, if we combine them, if we, if we sum all these up, we can restore it to the value eight, which is the, the resulting sum of A and B. And there's, there are similar um, operations for this that you can have uh, for multiplication and, and other types of functions. So um, um, in this particular case, as you can see, there's a strong parallel here to homomorphic encryption. Um, however, instead of, of, of taking some, some values and encrypting them and having a public and private key, it's all about this shared ownership. Um, and there, there's a few things to take away. First off, no share reveals any statistical information, even if you had an infinite amount of compute, like if quantum computing was solved tomorrow, you couldn't look at this share by itself and actually and learn anything about what the true value is, right? Because you don't know what the other shares are. Um, <clears throat> secondly, we don't have to worry about where to store public and private keys because um, it, it's, it's evenly distributed across the people who are owning this, this data structure. Uh, and finally, we have a very similar interface um, to to federated learning that we saw before, right? So instead of um, instead of encrypting the value in the cloud, we actually create a public share. Change data, we create a private share, uh, and training ensues, right? Um, and so it's it's the same idea as, as homomorphic encryption. However, instead, we are using the shared ownership of the 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 numbers in question as opposed to um, encrypted values of the numbers that we were trying to do math on. And this turns out to be quite performant, so in relative to homomorphic encryption. So, so um, it depends a little bit on how fast your network is. So um, the general encryption requires more compute, requires more network bandwidth. Um, but generally speaking, MPC tends to be quite a bit faster.
All right, so now the final, um, uh, hmm, yeah, we're, we're a little too much detail there. So the final thing I wanna talk about um, is gradient marketplaces for safe AI. So the idea here is that um, we want to be able to set, take these tools and make them widely available um, through open source toolkits in such a way that, that people can actually um, uh, meet each other, right? And, and people with data can meet people who have who have uh, uh, machine learning models they want to train, um, and, and these derivative assets can be created. So in this particular case, um, we have the challenge of, uh, this really focuses on the, the idea of pricing unseen data. So right, if, if AI Incorporated has a model that's hidden, right, and Jane's data has data that's hidden, um, and AI Incorporated sends down a model, uh, and then the model goes back up, there's this question of how much should AI Incorporated pay Jane, right, for, for her data? Um, and the, the the real trick here is that um, instead of, unlike the current dynamic where where companies sort of just buy data outright, um, we have been experimenting with the idea that instead um, AI Incorporated only pays Jane for the improvement to the model, right? So basically, when when the model goes down, it has a certain level of intelligence, right? When it comes back up, it's a little bit smarter. So instead of buying data, what AI Incorporated can actually pay for is incremental increases in intelligence. Uh, and this is where, where um, open marketplaces uh, like peer-to-peer -peer technology or blockchain um, can, can, can really shine and offer us some interesting, interesting alternatives. And, and these are the kinds of tools that we're working on building at, at OpenMind. Uh, so finally, I'd just like to kind of, uh, I guess, conclude with a little bit about uh, OpenMind in particular. So. Um, Hackathon. It was in 2019. 2,500 members in Slack, and around 145 people have committed code on GitHub. Um, and as far as things that we're looking to to, to build next, uh, the main thing we're focusing on right now is this peer-to-peer -peer technology for PyTorch, right? Which is really the foundation um, upon which things like multi-party computation and federated learning can live. So in the past couple of weeks, we merged into the code base. Uh, I think some great work uh, by by Jason and Bobby and others. Um, the ability to to send PyTorch objects over IPFS so over this peer-to-peer -peer technology, um, and the cool thing is that, um, and actually, what I merged, uh, no, what I'm merging later today is the ability to do auto grad, um, uh, so automatic differentiation uh, on this as well. So PyTorch has really awesome uh, automatic differentiation technology, um, and and so what we've what we've integrated into the code base so far is the ability to to have tensors that you control locally that are sitting on a remote server. Um, um, we had some great benchmarks on on our open grid, uh, and then of course we're working on reinforcement learning with Unity's machine learning agents team. Um, yeah. So as far as things going forward, uh, we're really focusing on on PyTorch first because it's it's um, it's shown us that the the types of things that we're wanting to do are definitely not the kinds of things that most deep learning frameworks were really designed to do originally. But PyTorch seems to be most flexible um, for adding in things like multi-party computation because of its um, sort of sort of sort of NumPy dynamic structures. Like there's just a lot of things about it that make it a little easier to work with. Um, so we're first starting with implementing federated learning in PyTorch, uh, moving on to MPC. So actually we just merged a really awesome, or sorry, saw an initial pull request for this coming in this week. Uh, and then we're adding in sort of the ability to, to execute payments across the grid that will facilitate this kind of market dynamics. Um, and finally, we would love to see um, the training and machine learning models that can be leveraged inside of private applications. Uh, the end on time here, so um, we'll go ahead and jump straight towards uh, questions. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for, for your attention. I hope you enjoy this presentation. Uh, I look forward to answering some of your questions. Andrew, many thanks for your tremendous talk. It's been great to see how all of the technologies fit in together to create a unique product again. Even more cool is that it's all open source and built by the community. Now, let's have a look at the questions from the audience. So the first one is, uh, when do you expect a project to be finished? And how do you think it will impact how we and GAFA, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, do machine learning? Um, so as, well, I guess I'll start with the, the first one. Um, as far as when I think it'll be done, I mean, these things are honestly difficult to predict because uh, we're we're sort of building things that I I don't many of which I don't think have been built before. 
Um, so it's difficult to sort of forecast some of the challenges. And also because we're working as volunteers, um, you know, it's all difficult to predict how, how many people are going to be working on a given weekend. Um, but um, I, I can generally predict that, that we're going to have some federated learning interfaces within the next um, probably month or so. Um, so for kind of the basic basic interfaces, I wouldn't necessarily uh, say that they're going to be mature. Um, but as far as the ability to train a machine learning model that's living on on multiple different servers, um, we are we are at the precipice of, of that ability now. Um, as far as multi-party computation, um, which is really the next step after that, um, uh, Bobby Wagner and others have been working really, really hard on getting those interfaces uh, working ahead of time, sort of in parallel to the federated learning work. So, so I'm. I hope to see that some kind of initial operations for that in the next couple months. Um, uh, so definitely check out the GitHub to see see updates on those. Um, as far as kind of the gradient marketplace and more advanced integrations into blockchain or into other other forms of payment, um, those are likely going to take a little bit longer because it really depended on how earlier interfaces shake out. Um, as far as how I think it will impact um, how major players do machine learning, um, so it's. That that thing's it's kind of difficult to tell, right? So it's sort of like asking, you know, how do you think TensorFlow or PyTorch or you know a, a framework, what's ultimately a tool set, will affect uh, big corporations? Um, so our hope is that 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 federated learning, um, that multi-party computation will will become um, popular trends uh, in the AI ecosystem. Um, I think that it's it's um, they've got some really really awesome use cases, uh, and especially in a climate where people uh, continually in like continually value privacy more and more and security more and more um, that I think that these tools have a lot to offer. But I mean, obviously I can't predict what, what big players like that will, will do. Thank you. Uh, what do you think is the biggest, what do, what do you think the biggest challenge will be with the adoption of secure AI? Hmm. So, there's probably two ways to answer that question. One is from a technical standpoint, and the other one's from more of a social standpoint. So technically, the biggest challenge is going to be uh, um, <laughs> uh, network overhead <laughs> and compute power, right? So um, the the the, the trade-off for all these things is uh, that it just requires more more power, right? More either more bandwidth or a bigger, beefier GPUs to be able to have sort of comparable AI that's that's either privacy preserving or secure. Um, but we're hoping to mitigate that um, uh, by you know dropping things down to the GPU, all this, the standard the standard deep learning toolkit for making things fast. Um, as far as the biggest societal challenge, um, the one in the short run is really just education. Um, not very many people are really familiar with um, the techniques for privacy preserving and secure AI. Like it's it, they're relatively new fields, right? You know, you don't go to Nips and like here, see like you know whole whole uh, conference rooms dedicated just to private machine learning, secure machine learning yet. Like it's not not really in the mainstream yet. So really, one of the one of the big things that I'm hoping will happen this this year in particular is that sort of the the amount to which privacy is really kind of stepping into the forefront is one of the most important things to our society. I really hope that private AI and secure AI will will also uh, become kind of industry standard terms that everyone's talking about. Um, and that, that everyone from entrepreneurs to, uh, to deep learning practitioners to educators will really get on board with, with these new tools. Thank you. How can you prevent adversarial updates of the model? Yeah, so there are, there are various attack vectors um, that, ha that have kind of different levels of, of us having addressed it. So if you think about, um, in this particular case, um, uh, adversarial updates might be okay. So Jane is intentionally trying to do something nefarious, right? And and only you know encourage the model to have some sort of bias or to to maybe just be be destroyed entirely, right? Um, so this this really comes down to the robustness that we can do validation. Um, and we've got some some pretty cool ideas, many of which I think are, are quite novel for for being able to do this. Um, and what it really comes down to is. Um, uh, at the the simplest way to answer that is it's just you know pulled out and cross file right uh, but as it turns out there's some more interesting uh, dynamics that, that are really at play when trying to do kind of hold out um, between you know AI incorporates hold out set and cross file across this whole ecosystem um, when you're doing it in an open marketplace like this um, so it's it's an open problem we think that we have some really good ideas but until until the platform is more mature it's going to be difficult to test them um, but that's definitely the right question to be asking uh, and a lot of people are working on it okay. 
Okay, so the next question is, what do you think about training a generative model on private data and then use the model to generate fake data with the same patterns as the private data? Yeah, so at the end of the day, all machine learning models are a compression of a data set, right? So um, one of the things that, that uh, a, a kind of private AI called, or a subject of private AI called differential privacy is all about, is about studying and understanding exactly how much information is being taken um, from, from, you know, when, when, when a machine learning model trains on data, it's fundamentally compressing the data in a lossy compression. One of the things we want to ensure is that that, that compression is lossy enough that whatever models leave can't be used to then you know, just predict out the data again. Um, so I think that if you did a generative model um, with really poor differential privacy settings, you absolutely could do this. Um, um, and really one of, the big, one of the big open research questions for differential privacy right now is figuring out exactly how to quantify how much of your data is inside of a model so that we can prevent that exact thing from happening. What if one or more peers in multi-party computing fails? Is it fault tolerant, able to recover? That's a great question, Dominic. Um, so the local operation um, is not fault tolerant, right? So, so if one of the peers in MPC, MPC dies, then the, the interaction between those two parties has to sort of do a reboot, right? Um, but the way that we see it in the context of federated learning, you know, you have AI incorporated working um, in parallel with, with lots of different individual data owners. So it's, it's not catastrophic to, to the, the marketplace or even the model that's being trained. Um, it's just to this particular gradient update, right? So that, that gradient would, would fail because this worker died. Um, with other schemes for multi-party computation where you actually share it, um, so, so in this particular one, one detail that I guess I glossed over is that we typically were advocating the use of two-party multi-party computation. So, um, only two parties are actually sharing things at a time, uh, and then it gets reshared with Jack and then reshared with Joe, uh, so that these kinds of uh, losses are not catastrophic to the network, right? So that's, that's a great question. Okay, and a couple of more questions. Uh, how was the idea of Open Mind formed? Any advice on how to manage such a complex project and get all the support of the community? Um, so it was, um, it was formed, <laughs> so I, I, there's this really cool uh, place in Oxford called the Future of Humanity Institute, um, and I had the privilege of spending some time uh, just amongst that community, um, and, and I came to, to really have a respect for, for the problems that we're facing with, with privacy and security, um, and really the, the thing that stood out to me about a year ago was that, that we don't have good tooling to even try out some of these algorithms. Like federated learning has been around for a while, differential privacy, multi-party computation, like these algorithms individually are, are not new, right? They've, they've been around for a little while, at least a year or two. Um, but the problem is, is that we don't necessarily have deep learning frameworks that actually pull in all these different algorithms, particularly MPC, because it's from cryptography, right? Cryptographers and machine learning experts don't necessarily chat as much as they should, um, and have a one one toolkit that we can actually try out and, and innovate and experiment and, and work with. Um, so um, that was really how Open Mind got started, was just by acknowledging that by while spending time around at the FHI, um, and as far as um, uh, the second question, which was, how do we keep the community going? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think the right answer is is through help of people who care about these problems, uh, just like you. So uh, feel, feel free to, to come on by and join the Slack. Uh, and I would love to uh, merge your first pull request and make you an official open minder. OK, so uh, the last two questions. Uh, the first one from Alash. What if a user applies his GDPR rights and wants to withdraw his data or updates in this case? Are there any ways to untrain the models? Man, that is a great question. Uh, check out a paper from Don Song and her and her lab. I actually forget who the first author is, um, called The Secret Share. Um, and it, it, um, while it doesn't have uh, explicit ways to necessarily untrain the models, it does have ways to, to really measure um, whether a piece of intelligence is inside of that model at a more granular level than has previously been seen. Um, I'm personally, in my own research, looking into answering that question and trying to figure out if we can. Um, so hopefully, um, hopefully we, 
there will be a paper coming out soon that, that innovates more on that, because um, I think it is a really important need. Thank you. And the last question, are there any theoretical results about what cannot be done in training data or models, in protecting training data or models? Yeah. Um, so the answer here, like many things in computing, is that um, most things can be done, but not all things are computationally feasible. Right? Not, not all things are tractable. Um, um, but I will highlight some of the things that are probably most difficult. So for example, um, um, hiding the architecture of a neural network uh, is really, really, really difficult. Um, as well as uh, homomorphic encryption, I think it really can't be done in an intractable way for most deep learning models these days. Um, and I, I think something that's maybe up in the air is uh, whether, whether or not privacy preserving or secure AI can actually be done in a way that's as fast as or as efficient as um, plain text models, uh, and that's just because you know there's there's overhead to encryption, there's overhead to NPC, uh, there's overhead to federated learning. Okay, so that was it for the questions. Uh, before the final remarks, interesting fact: we've reached an uh, amazing two days of total viewing time during the talk. Uh, now, Andrew, let me say thank you again for the talk. I hope the open mic. Open Mind Project will reach a successful finish soon. And we will see all of those technologies combined in a unique, uh, unique solution. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And don't forget to check out our Facebook and Twitter. Uh, the video will be uh, uh, put uh, on our website. So yeah, thanks again.